the wind's blowing like that, you know, as far as initial attack, you're really not doing anything as far as suppressing the fire. And so people have been asking this, you know, how, how do you do this? How do you do this? You go in front of that fire and you tell people to get out of the way. I think it was probably about five o'clock. Uh, we heard an explosion. Sandy went outside, came in and said, Pete, I think you need to come take a look at this. I think it's time we leave. It's already burned into people's places. You're pretty much driving down these roads and finding folks that weren't able to get out and helped them get out. In the McKinley fire, yeah, the initial attack there, there was uh, numerous fires going on throughout the state and had been all summer. Resources were stretched pretty thin. We also had quite a few fires back here in the core area and then the Deshka fire started approximately the same time as well. By the time we headed down our road toward the highway, we could see that the fire was already uh, torching over the tops of the trees. And we drove through embers. The fire was hot enough on the right side of the car that Sandy could feel the heat through the door as we drove through it. And we left. We didn't know if our place was going to make it or not. You know, we don't want to see anybody's property or their livelihood burn. So when we can't, you know, when, we're, when we have to focus on, on getting the people out and the houses are left to burn, that's, that's hard on all of our folks. You know, there's uh, times I had to pull firefighters off of homes that were burning to go make rescues farther down the road. So it uh, takes a toll on folks for sure. Well, the initial attack of both the sockeye and this fire were pretty much that. This one was much worse though. Just the drier conditions, it moved faster, it jumped the highway much easier. The sockeye took a while to get across the highway, you know, and it took a while to actually get across the railroad. This did it without any issues, and it did it very quickly. The reason it was such an extreme event was just the combination of the warm temperatures, the strong winds, and the low relative humidities, and that it lasted for about two days straight that those winds kept blowing, and it stayed warm, and it stayed warm at night, and it stayed dry all night long with those, with those winds in combination of that. Now this is a season that's the driest in recorded history in Alaska by far. We've shattered the records. August, wettest month of the year here, 5.11 inches is the average uh, for any given year, and we only got 0 0.33, so way, way, way below normal. So when the soil becomes this dry because of that drought, um, that deep duff, uh, some of that stuff is a foot and two feet, sometimes even three feet deep. A lot of the vegetation out there, the trees in particular, they're, they're shallow rooted. They don't have to drive deep roots to find water in this country. So the roots stay on top of, the, of that soil. They grow in that organic. When you burn that organic off, anything the root was attached to in there that's typically holding it up, now let's go and those trees can tip over very easily, sometimes just on their own, without any wind, uh, water, snow, anything. They just fall. I wouldn't walk through it on a, on a gusty day for sure. I mean, and even, even a day when the winds are fairly light, I mean, you still wanna make sure, you know, you're watching where your, your footing is pretty treacherous out there actually, so you wanna watch that. And not to mention, keep your eyes up too. Look around you, see what's going on, pay attention to what you're walking under, what's uh, where those trees are in relationship to your location. Certainly for the next uh, few weeks or a month, I, it would not surprise me for people to continue to find hot ash pits out there. And so as they're moving around and maybe assessing their ground, um, I would certainly be very careful as I was walking. Um, could it hold through the winter? Yeah, especially on, a, on an area that might be a little bit sheltered um, where it doesn't get uh, heavy snow laying on it all winter long. I think this is going to be a norm here. We're going to have these fires more often. My only advice for folks is put the work into your property to make sure that all you have to do is get in your vehicle and drive out of there. A lot of the houses that you saw survive here, that's exactly what they had, you know, defensible space. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of the houses that we saw 
burn <coughs> and structures we saw burn had very little defensible space, if, if none. Help me help you. If I have room to get in and work and protect your property, I will. I can't risk lives of my firefighters to protect property. And it takes, uh, you know, 22 people minimum is what we try to have on every structure fire. So when you have a, a wildland engine that doesn't have that equipment and only three people on it, then that's, uh, that's not a realistic expectation for them to do. The Alaska Division of Forestry has the Forest Stewardship Program, which I manage, and we provide free technical assistance to private landowners, and that includes free site visits. We'll come out, we'll meet with you one-on-one, -on -one, talk about your forest management goals, what you can, you can do to make sure that your forest remains healthy, especially in the face of the spruce beetle outbreak that we have going on. And we also do firewise assessments for people. So we come bring a checklist, we look at your property, we add up a score of all the things that you your property has that contribute to fire danger and then give you that checklist with your fire danger rating and then give you personalized recommendations on how to firewise your property. So the first zone of defense that we talk about in this firewise booklet is from zero feet to 15 feet from the primary structure. That is one of the most critical zones to prevent embers or the advance of the, the advanced flaming front from impacting your house. What you don't want to see within this zero to 15 foot zone are any spruce trees or any conifers. So this is a good example. There are no needle bearing trees, no uh, dead vegetation, nothing flammable stored in this area. And that's especially critical when you have uh, wood siding or flammable siding on your house. It's also critically important if you have uh, vents to have them screened with one eighth inch screen that will prevent embers from entering that, that vent. And if you have exposed eaves, um, if you can have them covered up somehow, that is also important. When you have a wooden deck such as this one, this is a great example of enclosing the area underneath the deck so embers cannot find their way underneath that deck. If you're not able to enclose the deck such as this one, it, it's important not to store firewood, lawnmowers, or gas cans, or anything flammable underneath that deck where an ember could enter and ignite that material. Yeah, a lot of the structures that burn, burn because of the ember shower. It rains embers when these fires come. So if you have places where embers can accumulate underneath your house, uh, wood piles up against your house, dryer vents, things like that, that's where the fire is going to start in your home and burn your home down. You shouldn't store firewood within 30 feet of a structure. And this is just a fantastic example of what happens to a sack of dried, cured firewood and why you wouldn't want to have it within 30 feet of a structure. It is tempting to have firewood stored on your porch so you can just go grab it and take it inside. But when a fire comes through and that ignites, that is the last thing you want near your house. And here we have the natural forest. It's about 30, 30 feet from the house. This is an ideal setting for this forest. It's mostly birch, a few scattered spruce. You can see if you look over here, there's, there's a cluster of spruce trees growing together. That's, that's acceptable as long as it's at least 30 feet from the house. You can start having those spruce trees growing naturally close together. If they're any taller, I would recommend pruning and perhaps thinning a few of them. Looking around here, you see hardwood species, which are naturally less flammable. We're standing in the yard, which is a good clear spot, 30 to 45 feet from the house over on this side. There's grass that's well-maintained, well-watered, growing all the way up next to the house. Non-flammable roofing material, such as this metal roof, are usually the best to have uh, for firewise principles. If you have a, a wood roof or a cedar shake roof, it's uh, important to keep it as clean as possible. Uh, no leaf, leaf debris or needle debris. Uh, keep, keep your gutters clean. Firefighter access. If a firefighter is going to be able to safely enter the property and defend it, they have to be able to get their apparatus in there. Now behind us we have this wide gravel turnaround area where pretty much any firefighting apparatus could enter, defend the property, and exit. It's also important to have the house address clearly listed from the street so firefighters and uh, emergency personnel can view that, that house number and enter the property. All these firefighters are really, really good at what they do. 
um, from the fire departments and from forestry. And uh, but you know we can't do in 20 minutes what you were supposed to do in 20 years. You know that's the big saying and. That's the truth. And on these kind of fires, we're not going to have the ability to even attempt to save your home. We're only going to have the ability to try to save you and pull you out, you know, and help direct you out.